Ruth, it's, it really is such an honor to to have you here and to hear your voice. You, you've 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 had what what seems to me almost like a number of different careers. I would say so. That's sometimes how I feel. Which hat am I wearing? What day? So when you were going to school, what did you want to be? So to be honest, I wasn't sure. I I knew I liked words, I knew I liked writing, I knew I liked storytelling, so journalism kind of was where I was headed. Um, but I remember going into a class at BYU and they said, there are more people in the, journals, in the broadcast journalism major across the United States than there are spots in the country to get a job. And so they said, it's very, very difficult, think very, very hard. And interestingly enough, for all of the students in that class that didn't really listen and thought, I'm gonna be one of those kids that gets one of those few spots, uh, within just a few years, there was this you know, profusion of new cable channels. That wasn't on the scene then, but in very short order it was, and every one of those kids that wanted to go into that could have gotten a job, you know, if they just had kind right. of gone down that path. Interesting. Yeah. And so you did that for, how long were you, like you were the lead anchor at, uh, it was Channel 5, right? Yes, so my first job right out of school uh, was at KUTV Channel 2, that was the first okay. person who gave me a job, first station, and I worked there just one year. And then I was able to go back to Arizona, I grew up in Phoenix and worked for the ABC station and worked there for a few years. Then my husband's job transferred us to Washington, D.C., and so we went back there for about six years. I worked for um, ABC and CBS back there. And then we moved back here. His job again transferred us here. And then I came back, and I thought I'd go back to Channel 2 because that's where I had worked before, but they were actually on the um, auction block. They were being sold. And I called KSL and said, would you be interested? They said, you're coming from a top 10 market. We usually lose people from our number 30-something market to get to a top 10, you're going the other way, we'd love to have you. Um, anyway, so I came there, worked there for 10 years, then I worked at Channel 4 for five years. So I've worked every place but Fox News in, in Utah, <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, and the 10 o'clock for 15 years, so I was the voice of death and destruction in your living room for 15 years, sorry about that. I hope I got some good news in there as well. What would you have people know about the state of media, the state of journalism, uh, I have a lot of entrepreneurs or, or CEOs reach out and they'll get like an inquiry from a media outlet or a journalist and they're not like really sure if it even matters, if it's worth their time to respond, what the impact would have and, and in terms of telling their story. What would you have them know? Well, I would say when you get an inquiry, it's always worth it to answer and engage unless it's a completely unreputable organization. But Think about it this way. If a story is going to be told, who do you want to control the narrative? If you tell the story, you get to control that narrative or at least have a significant voice in that narrative and you want to tell your own stories. And sometimes we're not that good at telling our stories but it's really critical that we're out telling stories. Um, there is a reason that people still watch all kinds of shows, whether it's just your basic local or national news you know, program in the evening or if they're watching in depth or, you know, true crime or whatever, because those stories are compelling. We are interested in what those stories say. And so, same thing, if you're the CEO, tell your story. Uh, you you want to control that narrative. And you, you left news, uh, once you left, did you go to the, did you immediately go to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or was there a? No, um, after I left news, I first of all went to BYU. I'm a BYU grad. All right, you At the time, adjunct. I was a BYU yeah, yeah. grad once, I'm now a BYU that twice. Um, I went to BYU and was an adjunct teacher in their journalism, which was so much fun because I was re-energized by those wonderful students who were so much better than I was, you know, from my time in the 80s. They were so smart and they were global thinkers and they were digital natives, right? I will always speak with a digital accent because I'm a digital immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, I started, I never had a computer in college and I started my career with a manual typewriter, right? But these students just, it was so fun to be around these BYU students because they, they understood the importance of a service piece and a purpose piece to what they did. So they really taught me, but I got to teach them kind of a capstone class when they were 
just about to graduate, to make sure that when they landed in a newsroom around the country, they knew how to tell a story. They knew how to put it together. They could anchor it. We made everybody do the weather because, you know, you stand up without a script and can do the weather. We did those kinds of things. So that was really fun for me, and I did that several years. And then I was recruited to the church. Yeah, tell us about that experience, being re recruited to be like you were the spokesperson for the church. I was the spokesperson for the church. So I was teaching at BYU, and I got a call and um, to go up and visit with the head of public affairs there. And so we sat down, and he said, you know, we need voices, and we need people that A, understand the media, and B, can tell a story, um, and understand that power of stories. And he said, we think we are going to probably have two members of our church who run for the president of the United States, Huntsman and Mitt Romney. And he said, plus there's this thing, it's coming out on Broadway, it's called Book of Mormon Musical, we think it might be big. And um, there were all lots of other important issues of our day that were bubbling up and they said, we really want someone that can help us, that understands the media, would you come and work with us. So I knew I'd be there for a season and you know it was gonna be a busy season and lots happened. It was like from 2011 on 2012. So the missionary age change happened and just it, Prop 8 had just kind of wrapped up and in, 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 there were all kinds of um, interactions with the HRC and we just, it was a really busy, busy time on very, very important issues for the church and really for the world, and so I thought that would be a really great opportunity, and it turned out to be one of the best experiences of my life. I kind of went dragging my heels a little bit because I loved what I was doing at BYU, and I wasn't sure I wanted to get into that hot pot, but it was awesome, and I worked with wonderful people, and I, was, I got lots of prep when they send, it turns out when you send thousands and thousands of young 18-year-old kids into the mission field, there's a lot of crises, and you learn crisis communications really fast. And so that was really um, a great experience for me as well. I just loved it, and so I was there for several years. What was your biggest learning lesson from that experience with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Um, an organization of that size, of that magnitude, it's a global organization, it's the biggest organization in the state of Utah, just about like how they operate from like a business and organizational mm -hmm. perspective, what what was your biggest takeaway from that? It's just it's just such a massive organization. That was one of the takeaways. It is massive, and each individual department is massive. So if you're talking about the worldwide missionary department, or you're talking about seminaries and institutes, or you're talking about priesthood and family, they are massive, all individually, and then you group them all together. And I remember thinking, you know, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. We're just regular people trying to run this massive thing. Um, but it's kind of miraculous that it runs as well as it does and moves forward and takes care of all that it does around the world. And I think that what I loved is that being in public affairs, I got a little bit of an extra glimpse of seeing the great service that a lot of people miss, that a lot of people don't see, um, that was done by members of the church, uh, partners of members of the church, people, you know, groups and organizations that we partner with, Catholic Community Services, Red Cross, Red Crescent, all those around the world to do good. And I think one of my takeaways was the goodness of people everywhere. And when we look for them, we find them. And when we partner with people who might be a little bit different than we are, we learn from them. And it is really incumbent upon all of us, this is my own personal you know, philosophy, but I watched it and I saw it work, that it is incumbent upon every one of us to try to um, reach out, reach across, build bridges, and do things that make the world better, that lift people one at a time. Yeah. How'd you get to New Skin? So I'm just going along, minding my own business at the church, and I got a call from um, the head of HR at New Skin, and he said, would you come talk to us? And I said to my husband, I said, you know, I'm not gonna go take a job at New Skin. I live in Salt Lake, the headquarters are in Provo, I like my job here, you know, but I've heard amazing things about the founders and the people at New Skin for years and years, and I'd use their products, and you know, you can't live in Utah very long and not know something about New Skin, it's almost 40 years old and it's just 
been a great economic engine and all these things that's in 50 countries. So I said, I'm going to go meet them at least. And I spent the day with the then CEO, who was Truman Hunt at the time, and one of the founders, Steve Lund. And I got back in my car, and I got on my phone, and I said to my husband, I think I'm going to have to take this job. And he said, what? And I said, I just, I can't tell you exactly why, but I know I need to take this job. I need to have this experience with these people around the world. And it has been, and I said, I'll probably just stay like two years, maybe three. I'm just about to hit nine. And I've just been learning since the day I set foot at New Skin. I have loved it. It's been an amazing opportunity. Well, and the company has transformed a lot since you've been there. Like uh, a lot of people don't realize how much of a tech company New Skin is now. Right, when you think about companies that are 40 years old, if you haven't evolved, you're in big trouble. And so there have been multiple iterations, and we've had, I think one of the main things is we've had tremendous leadership with vision. So whether that's the original founders of Blake, Steve, and Sandy, or the um, subsequent CEOs and leadership teams they have had, they've been really, really capable and pretty much visionary as well. And so we have Ryan Napierski leading the way now, and he has a tremendous vision. And whether you are a born tech company or not, you have to be tech enabled, you have to be tech powered. And that's what we're doing at New Skin. And in this world of social commerce, I mean, social commerce has disrupted e-commerce, and that's where people are going. Why? Because we care about what people say, that we trust people, and we trust people that we know, and we like, I mean, we like to think of ourselves as one of the original social networks, because think about it, it used to be one-to-one, face-to-face. We still do that, we just do it online, but we understand the power of personalization, the power of customization, the power of taking care of your customers and putting the customer at the center of everything you do. You just get to have technology help you, so your reach is just enormous and endless. I do these interviews a lot, and uh, the feedback I always get is like, why don't you ask what the company does? And I just like assume like people know what these companies do. Um, so what does New Skin do? Tell everyone what New Skin does. New Skin is an integrated beauty and wellness company. We operate in, like I said, about 50 countries around the world. We have two areas. Uh, we have um, beauty and wellness. So we, we like to think of ourselves as integrated. We work on inside and outside. So sometimes that means like, for instance, ingestible collagen right now, that's a big product. We have tremendous supplements, uh, things that work on gut health or joint health or all kinds of things, eye health. Um, and then we also do beauty on the outside and do fabulous products uh, that we've had anti-aging lines and we've had all kinds of just great skin products. Uh, we have oral care, we have hair care, we have all kinds of products that. So we sell those. We're about, we're publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. We're about just over two and a half billion dollars annually. So like I said, an economic engine in Utah and around the world. It's an enormous company. Has anybody been down to Provo, their headquarters? Come down and visit. Yeah, it's, we it's love it. We are incredible. really proud of our LEED certified building that was dedicated back in 2013, one of the first ones that really thought about sustainability as we were constructing the building. And um, that just continues to be an important focus for us going forward too, whether it's in our packaging, our ingredient sourcing, our products, because we think that's a really an important lever that um, connects to our business in the future. Right. And, and now, and more so in the future. I want to talk about your role. Just, just real quick, raise your hand if you have a question, because we do want to make this uh, as interactive as possible. So, um, yeah, uh, do we have a mic here? We'll, we'll get you a mic as we wait for that. I feel like I need to run out. You know, I've interviewed more than I've answered the questions. I feel like I need to say, okay, what's your question? <laughs> right here. If I said Phil Donahue, Donahue, these people are kind of too young to know. You probably know, are too. I know too. Phil, I know uh, Phil Donahue. Or, or the Oprah effect, you know, running around yeah. with, the, with the mic. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Mike Alder, and I'm head of technology transfer at BYU. You said some nice things. Appreciate that. And uh, we've licensed to New Skin. I was in Steve Lund's office. What an office. Um, the day that the tabernacle burned. And that was quite a day. And now to have that uh, edifice that's come in its place is amazing, the temple. 
Um, just honored to have the relationship with uh, both New Skin and BYU and what you're saying today. Thank you, that's very kind of you. I will say this, when it comes to, I don't care if it's journalism or business or these kinds of days where the news hits your business, but the thing that I think I've appreciated most, and I saw this at BYU, I see it at New Skin, is that people care, good people are trying to do good things to make the world better. And I, 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 you saw it if you were up in his office, that's who Steve is, and that has permeated through the company. Blake's the same way, Sandy's the same way. You know, the, the mission of New Skin is that we try to empower people to improve lives. And that means all of the lives on all the levels. That means the employees, that means the people who sell our products, that means the people who use our products, and that means the people who are touched by our foundation and the other good charitable works and uh, initiatives that we do. Were you at the company when the tabernacle burned down? I was not. No. Is, is, have people been down there since? Come down, come visit. Like, by the way, Provo is just incredible. It doesn't Provo's get enough just, credit. We love being right there. You know, people say, now where are you located? Right at the corner of University and Center Street. 75 <laughs> West Center Street is our address. We love being in the heart of Provo. We love Provo, Utah. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's becoming a pretty happening place, Center Street and Provo. It's pretty cool. Uh, what, who, who else has a question? Yeah, right here. Hi. Um, so I was feeling concerned as I was reading this article about these new... Um, disinformation agencies, I, I don't know what to call them, but like clients could hire them and they would intentionally saturate the internet with incorrect information to suit the client's purposes. And when I think about the everyday consumer, you know, how do you, if we're trying to get factual information to make our business decisions, you know, to navigate clear sources or courses, sorry, um, I get kind of concerned thinking this would probably increase over time as there's um, fights over mindshare maybe. Have you run into any of that or do you have any ideas on how we can? You know, I watched that, that carefully and we started down the path a little bit about the way that the media has changed and it's changed dramatically. And I remember I couldn't even put a story on at 10 o'clock if I didn't have two corroborating sources, get both sides of everything. Um, you don't see that as much today. And, and, you know, anybody can throw up a beautiful website but be broadcasting out of their base. It's really hard to know uh, what sources to trust. And so you have to be vigilant. And for me, I like to um, consume a wide range. So I feel like I read and consume left to right and, and as much as I can in between. Um, what you're saying is how, you're, what you're asking is what, how do you know how to differentiate? It's hard, it's hard, but, but I will tell you, I deal a lot in reputation. Over time, reputations are built, and in sometimes moments, reputations fall. And so you watch carefully to see what the chatter is around those, you know, and those different entities, and you look carefully, and you try to look at a broad spectrum as you're looking, um, but, there is disinformation. I think that as algorithms change, I mean, we're, and, and you know, in, info security, infosec is, is getting better. We're trying to get better at, you know, sussing them out and understanding what you can trust and what you can't. But that's going to continue to evolve. It's going to be a whack-a-mole in a little, you know, in a way that you just are going to have to continually find out ways and watchdogs to um, see who you trust. Um, it's just, it's a different, it's a different industry. In fact, one of the most interesting differences is we used to hold you hostage. And by that, I mean, if you wanted to um, get the weather, we held you hostage till quarter after. We didn't say one thing except for Mark Eubank would get on in his white coat and tease that it might snow. We'll tell you about it a quarter after. And if you wanted the sports scores or to see the high school highlights, you're held hostage till 25 after. We told you, we kept you coming to us. But now, I don't have my phone with me. Now, everybody has a smartphone and a very powerful computer in their, house, in their hands. They don't need us. They don't need to wait till, nobody. Your generation does not wait and they rarely watch the news. It used to be part of my generation's daily. 
They did it on the daily. They don't do that anymore. And so with that, again, you need to curate sources you trust and be mindful of what's out there. And you can do some digging on sources to find out, is this a trustworthy source? You know, and there's a lot of information. So I think some of it is just, um, it takes some extra due diligence. And then, like I said, look at a broad spectrum. Does anyone watch the local news? Okay. See? <laughs> I remember one time we had uh, Mark Zuckerberg come. Uh-huh. I remember. To, I was there. To I Summit. Came. You yeah, remember this? Yeah, uh-huh. And someone told me, I think it was like my wife's uncle maybe, like, hey, uh, you're going to be on the, they keep teasing that you're going to be on the 9 o'clock news. Uh, because, uh, not me, but like me interviewing him, yeah. right? And like you're, you're going to be like the lead story on that. And I honestly had no idea how to watch that, what channel to go to. And then, so obviously I missed it, and then I couldn't find it after. <laughs> Right? Like, oh, I don't Clint, know. Oh, Clint, is, is, that, is that normal? Call me next time. I'll help you through okay. it. I didn't know what to do. Uh, anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, right here. Hi, Cynthia. Oh, Hi. Cynthia, how are you? How are you? Good to see you. Um, would you explain uh, how NewScan came about being a, a really force for good in the world? And uh, what was the incentive uh, from the top down, right, to to become such a um, influence uh, in the nonprofit world and through your nonprofit, you know, uh, sector of the organization, and why uh, you think that corporate America should follow your lead? Okay, that's a kind question because I think you know a lot of what we do, Cynthia. You work in the same space, but I'll tell you a couple things first of all. Newskin has a foundation, a Force for Good foundation. That is our nonprofit arm. And most people in Utah probably have no idea that uh, we have in Korea and Japan New Hope schools and um, New Hope libraries. In China and Southeast Asia, we have a children's heart fund that has um, done, help me, Rod, 16,000? 16 to 17,000 life-saving heart surgeries for children that have saved their lives. Um, that you don't know that we um, have, we have had an eyeglasses and screening program here in American Latin, Latin America largely. Um, that they do all kinds of things. We, have, we partner with, like I said, the United Way locally. You, do, you don't know, but we have our hands in a lot of pies and we love to. We also have a for-profit initiative called Nourish the Children. And Nourish the Children, our, our scientists took a little bit of a break from formulating products, and they went to work formulating um, a food product called Vitameal, and it's highly nutritive, for, formulated for children who are malnourished. And um, quite a few years ago, we started distributing that. We get uh, charity partners that work with us, for the distribution, we, our, our sales force purchase that Vitameal, donates that Vitameal, and we feed, um, like in Malawi, Africa alone, about 110,000 kids every single day. We have now served more than 750 million meals around the world of Vitameal. So that's our for-profit profit initiative. Why? I mean, and they just do stuff in every, in every market where we are. We try to empower the people to improve their lives. And that looks so differently, whether, you know, no matter who you are. But uh, there were one million AIDS orphans um, when there was the AIDS epidemic in Malawi. It was one of the hardest hit. And so our founders said, let's go over there and see if we can help them. That's where that Vitameal goes into these child-based care centers where these orphans went to school. It was an incentive to get them to school so they could get a hot meal every day. Why? The why behind that. You have people who care about the mission. The mission statement was first. We want to empower people to improve their lives. This is, um, and then they were like, well, how do we do this? This was Blake Roney, this was Steve Lunn, this was Sandy Tillotson, this was them talking about, we don't want to just be a company that sells lotion. I remember Steve Lunn saying that the first day, we are not really about selling lotion. We happen to sell lotion, but we are not really about that. And so many times um, it's been attributed to both Steve and Blake that um, um, 
selling products is 5% of what we do and who we are, but trying to make be a force for good in the world should be 95% of who we are. So they wanted to make sure that people that were affiliated with New Skin, no matter what, whether you bought, the, bought a product or used a product or um, sold a product, whether you wanted to make it your source, sole source of income or whether you just wanted to make a couple hundred extra bucks a month, whatever touch point you had, that you had a good experience and felt that desire to be a purposeful company and change the world for the better. What advice would you have for like, like a lot of companies say they do what New Skin actually does, right? Which is uh, be a force for good in the world and do all these like really uh, good initiatives. But, but sometimes it comes across as like more of like a marketing scheme for the product itself. And New Skin's done this in, uh, incredible job of being authentic about how they approach this. What advice do you have for those who are like building these types of companies who want to do good, want to give back, to make it ingrained in the culture from the beginning and in the mission from the beginning, and not to feel like, yes, we do this, but also, mm -hmm. you know, our, our main goal right. may, may be to just get you to buy our stuff. When you go into business, think about the word business. You're in a business to grow, to m make revenue. That's what you do it. You have to have a healthy, vital business to be able to, you know, do some extra good. So you have to have focus on that core business. But when you're starting out, ask yourself some important whys. Why could what we're going to do matter to people? Why and how could it make people's lives better? Like, instead of just pumping out this widget or whatever, what could we do? What could we connect it to, um, to make a difference? And I think when people have purpose, and we know this about Gen Zs and millennials, they don't even want to do business with companies that don't do something with purpose to give back. Um, and so as far as being authentic, I think you have to be. There's, we live in a world where if you're not transparent, it, you're going to be found out some way at some point. And so I think you try to start from your foundational days of being authentic. You know what? We have good days, great days, and we also have bad days. And so own the bad days and say, how are we going to get better? Sometimes you have bad actors that do bad things um, that give a black eye to the entire company. Those things happen. Pick yourself up, admit you were wrong, keep going, but hopefully you have put enough, uh, you put enough deposits in the bank of really trying to be authentically good that it will override a few bad actors that you know sometimes leave a blemish. How does Newskin choose the projects and initiatives it works on? I mean, there's so many problems in the world. How do you, like, how do you choose the Malawi thing? Like, how, how does that, like, where does that come from? Well, I think our founders saw that that was out of when there was this crisis in Malawi, there was this famine in Malawi, and Malawi got, for a minute, you know, it had quite a bit of world attention, and we went over to try to make a difference there. But we really want the people that have touch points with new skin around the world to decide where they are. So it wasn't Provo, Utah that came up with the Southeast Asia Children's Heart Fund or the China, Greater China Children's Heart Fund. It was the people there. And they said, we can make a difference here. So, so I think that the local markets, the local areas, they, they decide where they can make the most difference and, and we're supportive. That's very cool. Do we have more questions? Sounds like you are aware of day after day all the good stuff that happens at the organization you're at. When you have a really bad PR press cycle day and you're probably frustrated this is getting more attention than the last 100 days straight of awesome things we did. What's your strategy for confronting that? Well, at my age, you take the long view, you know? I mean, I, what I can tell you is don't lose hope because you have a bad day or a string of bad days or a reputation that really takes a beating. Know that, the, that time is your friend, and if you are authentic and careful, then you can rebuild. Um, but there are some things that you need to do in the immediate. You know, you want to use social media to try and build, your, you know, build that up. You should, hopefully you have friends in your space that can come to your aid as third-party validators. You know, I can tell you all day long about my brand. That doesn't build my reputation. What builds my reputation is third parties saying what she said. 
that's actually true. And so you, you make sure that you have, have friends along the way that will come to your, to your defense when you have those things. And then, like I said, you leverage social media. You leverage, um, you might put out a press release about something good you're doing. You, you, know, you, put, you, know, you work on your SEO and try to put the bad down and bring the good up. Just the normal things that you would know that you would do. Um, but you keep doing the good stuff. You know, that works from a personal standpoint as well as a company standpoint. You just keep trying to um, have more good than bad. And over time, time outs truth. And if you're doing authentically good things, that will come out over time because time will out the truth. What does the future of New Skin look like? Well, I hope really bright. We are, we are um, and have been for several years running uh, by Forrester, known for being the number one in the world um, at-home beauty device system. And we have got fabulous connected devices coming. Um, right now, we're just, we've, got, we've got the Lumi Spa, which is a cleanse and treat. You've probably seen it around on um, social media and, and uh, in traditional media places as well. That's gonna, going to be connected, and so, um, you're going to get tech that enables how you have, you know, what you do in your daily routine. And so we have other devices that are coming. We're really excited about the tech piece, the tech play, and being a, a device systems company as well as good products. We'll continue. We have great scientists. That's, that's one thing. If you don't have great products, you go out of business. If you don't have people that buy and then repurchase because they love your products, you go out of business. We have science-backed products, gr a great team of scientists that keeps putting out wonderful products. So I think, you know, we hope we just keep growing around the world. Final question, what advice do you have for those who uh, want to have the career that you've had? Hmm. Like all of these various uh, incredible job opportunities and these, these credible positions that you've held, what advice do you have like for them on how to navigate that, how to set themselves up for something hmm. like that? Well, I would say a couple of things, and that is, I, when I was teaching back at BYU, the first day of class, I always would tell my students, I can promise you that your life will not unfold the way you think it will unfold. It won't, it just won't. However, if you have a growth mindset, if you're open to change and some, a few bumps in your path and a few curves in your road, then, even though it doesn't unfold the way you want it to, it can unfold in the most beautiful, lovely ways. And if you're open to learning new things and pivoting and, and taking the hard days as learning days and the hard experiences as learning experiences, then I think you're gonna have a fabulous career. If you would have told me 10 years ago, you'll, you'll go to New Skin, you'll feel like you don't have financial literacy because you don't, and so you'll go back and get an MBA, I would have said, you are crazy. I never took accounting at BYU. I took the journalism classes. But life is interesting and throws you curveballs. And so when I went to my bosses at New Skin and said, I need to go back and get an MBA because I need financial literacy. I don't have to run your P&L, but I have to understand what's going on here. They said, we support you. We think that's a great idea. So stay open, stay um, flexible. Um, know that, that you will learn more from the hard days, right? You will learn more from the hard experiences than life just going along swimmingly. Life won't go along swimmingly. It will be hard. But if you just stay true to your core, know who you are, what you stand for, and um, keep that core strong, and then stay open with a growth mindset, I think you'll be just fine. Ruth, what an honor to have you here. Please give it up for Ruth Todd. Everyone.